Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Higgins. I'm a Leland Hunger Fellow with Catholic Relief Services. I'm also one of the humanitarian fellows that was in Northeast Nigeria the first year and DC the second year. Today, I'll be reviewing a few themes from analyses that I've conducted as they relate to localizing nutrition and food security programming and how we can ad advance efforts locally, whether with communities themselves, civil society organizations, subnational government staff, or national government staff. Next slide, please. So what is localization? Throughout humanitarian and development spheres, multiple terms have been used to localization. Like I just said, locally led development, local ownership, country ownership, et cetera. During this presentation, I'll probably use all of these terms. What we stress more at Catholic Relief Services is this principle of subsidiarity, that the communities closest to the challenges are artisans of their own development. So localization has been an ongoing effort for many years, especially with CRS, but in the last couple of years, it's gained more recognition globally. Listed are a few more recent US government efforts to improve localization, such as the New Partnerships Initiative to increase funding to local partners, PEPFAR's efforts to transition 70% of funding to local partners, the prior administration's journey to self-reliance to measure host country commitment and capacity, as well as a forthcoming local capacity development strategy and USAID's advancing nutrition project in select countries to strengthen host country commitment and capacity in multi-sectoral nutrition programming. Non-exhaustive list, just a couple examples. So why should we push further on localization and why am I highlighting these findings today? Because localization supports effective, meaningful, and sustainable humanitarian and development programming. One quote that really stuck out to me by Oxfam was that if local people don't feel the investment serves their interests, it won't actually deliver its full promised potential. Next slide, please. All right. Well, at CRS, I've conducted policy research related to nutrition and localization, as well as analyses looking at COVID and its secondary impact on food security. For this presentation, I'm highlighting three themes for the US government to further advance localization, flexibility, time, data, and analyses. Flexibility. This touches on many aspects. Flexibility of funding is incredibly important for COVID-19 response, given it allows for changing modalities as needed, for example, using vouchers when prices spiked because of COVID-19 restrictions. It also allows adaptation to changing contexts or new information, like if a host country releases a new multi-sectoral nutrition policy, and then we align our programming priorities behind it, as was the case for one CRS country. Time. We need to ensure that we're funding local organizations quickly to respond to emergency needs, or that we're not delaying funding to organizations running development projects. There have been cases we've heard through our research where delayed funding has caused the implementing organization to either have to cut down local staff and thereby reduce their programming, or in other cases, stop altogether. It also takes time to build relationships with partners, with civil society organizations, with faith leaders, local or national government staff, what have you. It takes time to build that trust. It also takes time to build the capacity of local organizations, whether improving their capacity to plan and budget for nutrition programming or improving their technical skills related to treating acute malnutrition. With data and analyses, if we better understand the political environment and where those levers of change are, then we can better target our programming and create more sustainability and impact. As part of that, these analyses should be done in partnership with organizations. Local organizations should be deciding how they're done, what happens with the data, so that they can take ownership and use the data for their own decision-making and priority setting. Data collected should also be shared so that we're reducing duplication of research efforts, programming efforts, sharing lessons learned, and increasing transparency to those served, as well as to relevant stakeholders. So perhaps these data could persuade the national government to make nutrition or food security a priority based on data and lessons learned that they're seeing. Data are persuasive, especially if it's coming from within their own country. Next slide. So putting localization into practice. Here are just two projects that include use of data in some form or another, and are examples that I believe can and sh should be replicated. So in Guatemala, 
This was not a CRS project, but one that I found to be a really great example. Through the Health Policy Plus program, networks of civil society organizations were trained in advocacy and they became fully knowledgeable about all applicable national and local government policies, guidance, regulations, and even budget allocations. They then routinely tracked adherence and performance of public health and education operations through performance indicators that are online, as well as through in-person site visits to schools and health facilities. So training the civil society organizations strengthens not only their own capacity for advocacy, but accountability by service providers, and then the quality of health and education services. In the case of Rwanda, to tackle stenting, um, the government there created a national early childhood development program to better use data for decision-making on nutrition interventions. The government of Rwanda asked CRS to help them develop their meal systems, their monitoring and evaluation system, excuse me. So a monitoring and evaluation staff person was then hired and embedded into the National Early Childhood Development Program, working for the government of Rwanda, but supported by USAID. So data collected was then shared with both parties, with both USAID and also the government of Rwanda to improve decision-making, streamline data collection, and ultimately enhance Rwanda's monitoring and evaluation capacities and ultimately ownership of their own nutrition data. Next slide. Any questions? And I also have my email if you have anything further that I missed. Great, and we'll open up any questions from the audience. I think we have a question in the chat. What was the biggest impediment to localization that you've seen? Hi, Dan, that really depends on the context. <laughs> um, but it went, we're, we're writing up our policy report right now. And so we've kind of bucketed into four categories, uh, capacity, commitment, coordination, and then, uh, then meal. So monitoring and evaluation. So it depends on the country. It could be the commitments by the local government to making nutrition a priority. Sometimes it is already a priority, like in Guatemala, but we're not seeing those stunting reductions. And so in some cases, it's more the coordination or maybe even the investments, getting the, the resource mobilization for those efforts. So there's not quite a singular answer. A lot of these things need to be all together in one. Um, nutrition governance is what we really, what we really hammer home in our report. Any other questions? Uh, another question. Have you seen any changes in the conversation around localization since the pandemic and the increased long overdue conversations around decolonizing development and aid? Yes, absolutely. So we keep using COVID as a reason why we should be localizing because with all of the expats leaving, it was the people who live there and work there doing the implementation. And so, and a lot of times the biggest impediment for them was just the funding. They were saying, we know what needs to be done. Just give us the money. Don't make things more complicated than they need to be. So absolutely, yes. COVID, COVID has given us an additional reason to localize further. 